Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. I think we need to discuss this. It's been long enough. Yes, because I had exams. Those bellends thought they could put me to the test. Well, not again. Not until the next set of exams, at least. God, my life is just one continuous cycle of despair. Boop, 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 boop. And on that note, I think it's time we talk about this situation. But let's start off with a story, because I know how much we love them here, on The Right Opinion. You see, I released a video on H3. I worked incredibly hard on the research that brought it together, the points I made, and I gave it a lot of thought, explaining why I believe they strayed away from their original content and this has subsequently led them to take a break. I took a very sympathetic point of view towards them because of how I felt. I think there are a lot of people who've been there. However, almost immediately after I released it, I received a few comments pointing out that H3 had got themselves in another shitstorm less than 24 hours before, leading my video to be timed fairly inconveniently. So what was this shitstorm? Well, let's talk about better help. Even if you're a YouTube casual, you probably will have heard of better help, the online interactive website that promotes therapy on an accessible platform the internet. So to give you a breakdown, if you're a patient of this site, you sign up and you fill out a basic form explaining what you're looking for and what you may be experiencing. And what they do is that they have an extensive roster of allegedly qualified therapists will return to the alleged part in the bit and they'll hook you up with one of these blokes. The ultimate aim? Well, generally to improve health, I assume. But if you've seen the title, you'll know that this is a video also about YouTubers. So where do they factor into this very enticing plot? Well, BetterHelp targeted a certain brand of YouTubers. In fact, ones that I like to talk about the most, the individuals who are seen as the moral bastions of the platform. This is no coincidence. These individuals have built special relationships with their fans, and unlike the Jake Pauls of this generation, they deal with more mature subjects. This is the sort of setup that is pretty perfect. And honestly, the environment has been set up neatly for something like this to come into play. Now make no mistake, BetterHelp has existed for a few years, since its inception in 2013. It was always purring in the background, but recently one of their marketing executives must have spotted an opportunity in the fertile grounds of YouTube, which is a smart idea in principle. In the last few years, YouTube has become a lot deeper than just a place where people put on facades for the day, and I've spoken about that in length in the past. It just seems like a progression of the culture. Amongst a lot of these deeper topics that have popped up in the last few years, one that seems increasingly prevalent is that of depression and mental health. There are multiple reasons for this. I think the online world has brought together a new set of people who find themselves away from the turmoil of their real lives, and in that escape we try to find answers for the problems that we face in our own minds, and one of those comes down to mental health. Depression and so on are complex topics. We need to be able to distinguish between when we may be experiencing mood dips and when we actually have an imbalance that disposes us to be depressed. A great example of the confusion of the two was Prince EA's video on how you're not depressed, you just shut up and that. Also, it was great to see that Prince EA made the Mental Health Awareness Day on YouTube after such an inspirational set of videos. YouTube really know their creators. YouTubers know that speaking about mental health is extremely sensitive. You can't be seen as taking advantage of the topic, but equally we are in a culture where people are being encouraged to be open about their experiences with conditions, and often being open about these things can help others, and we certainly shouldn't diminish that. On the other hand, we shouldn't be seen as clickbaiting it or taking advantage of the possible experiences of suffering to emotionally manipulate our audiences. So ironically, it becomes a whole different balancing act on working out how to appear genuine, which in a way is contrived within itself. But that's a topic for a different time. Creators who address these topics in their videos will create a bond with their audience, sharing an experience and maybe helping an individual to come to terms with their own struggles. So it made perfect sense that BetterHelp reach out to these lovely creators who are renowned for their reputability to promote their therapy website and help others make it through the same struggles. But there's a catch. In fact, there are a lot of catches. You see, we over on the YouTube platform are critical bastards, particularly in commentary. And YouTube, although not being exactly quite on the level of attention as much that comes along with celebrity status, still comes under investigation from commentators and media alike. And BetterHelp should have known this. Because regardless of what is discussed in the next 20, 30, 40 fucking minutes, I don't know how long this is going to be, the fact that they've been caught in such a whirlwind of controversy showed they must have done something wrong. And it should be a lesson to them. But we'd be dishing out lessons all day today. Like you're attending a college course, and this motherfucker right here is handing out scholarships. Because really, this whole thing goes a lot deeper than just better help. Today, I'm going to be asking what is wrong with better help, if there's anything wrong with the YouTubers who promote it, and if there's anything wrong with their responses. Because my exams may be over, but we're just getting started. So without further ado, let's dive right in.
Now, people have pretty much gone top to bottom of every single inconsistency within the website and its presentation, so when I clicked on, I expected to be mostly doing a cleanup job with a lot of the morsels left behind. But I was wrong, and I do have a lot to say. However, firstly, I'll give you a rundown of the set of controversies that they've faced down in the last few weeks. I definitely recommend checking out PewDiePie's videos, this covers it a lot. Their terms and conditions contained information that was rather sketchy, basically setting out the company as merely a third party. Most notably, even though they claim to run background checks on their therapist, they don't take responsibility if it's revealed that the therapist isn't actually qualified. A very unsettling clause, mainly for the reason that it might lead to employees being lax on the background checks, which might end up letting some unqualified and seedy individuals in such as Dr. Al Dershberger. Now, Big Al here is under indictment for rape charges. I want to emphasize, as always, that an individual is innocent until proven guilty, and people losing their job over any fake accusations is a legitimate concern. However, equally, when you're having people in positions of mental health counseling, a significantly more sensitive job, it might be best to not give them a platform until the charges are heard out at least. You could also make the point that an individual's occupation should not necessarily define whether they should be allowed to operate in their position. This is not an unfair point either, but I feel that given BetterHelp's self-acclaimed status as a facilitator, for them it might be best to err on the side of caution with these issues. Also, this is only a real source of criticism because when it was pointed out, they quickly removed his page, which says to me that it was more about a lack of vetting rather than just a different philosophy. Equally, there are many people who provide testaments where their therapist didn't appear to be sufficiently qualified in their behavior, at least, towards these individuals. I think this raises one of the first greater philosophical concerns. BetterHelp is a large corporation, and there is no denying that there are many people who've had positive experiences, nor am I denying that there are an array of qualified individuals doing a great job. But there is an incredible shifting of responsibility which makes the website prone to such mishaps. With any hierarchy, there are people who are expected to be held accountable for the employment of their subordinates. And in a clinic, this is typically localized to an extent. Although chains may have national managers and CEOs, you'll typically have some sort of branch manager who has that power. BetterHelp seems to have less of a structure when it comes to that. And although they have dedicated sectors, the lack of involvement seems to have alienated management from these issues, meaning that they have had let their growing criticism slip through the cracks, and this was culminating on the review sites. Although responses were predominantly positive, there was a significant proportion that were negative, and really there's a lot less room for error when dealing with mental health. And if these people had legitimate complaints, they probably should have been given more attention before BetterHelp decided to launch their platform into the public eye. However, going on their website, the reviews are fairly positive, even with a video review. Wow, so I must have been particularly passionate to submit their experience through the form of a video, apart from the fact that this guy was actually a paid Fiverr bloke, and I wish I was joking. So the credibility of such testimonials comes under scrutiny, particularly given how generic and banal many of these reviews seem and when comparing these testaments to the more mixed experiences documented elsewhere. This is all part of a greater point, however. The marketing. As mentioned, some people like BetterHelp. Some people have had positive experiences. In fact, it's very likely that a majority of people have had positive experiences. However, the truth is that when your job is merely to provide a platform and some dodgy practitioners are operating, just because they say they're not responsible doesn't mean other people aren't going to hold them responsible. They should have sorted out these concerns earlier and instead, we're here now. In response to a lot of the criticism, BetterHelp founder Alon Matas posted a response, which honestly just made themselves look worse in my opinion. Matas basically set up straw men of people's concerns, talking about certain claims, like the ones where the therapists were AIs, before saying how ridiculous they were. The simple truth is that even though some narratives were undoubtedly exaggerated, the concerns came from a legitimate place, and that cannot be undermined by pointing out the most far-fetched points of view. It came across as a very salty response. And make no mistake, sometimes YouTube, fandoms, etc. can overreact. I think it's perfectly reasonable to criticize when people go too far. In my Zoella video, for example, I make that clear. But equally, the context of matters being the founder of BetterHelp and the apparent presentation that this is him defending himself against the allegations means that people will not perceive this response well. And although I think discussing whether people are overreacting is a legitimate discourse that needs to be had, it just doesn't feel like he presented it as that. On top of this, he was so aggressive and braggadocious in the response that it came across as extremely narcissistic. He brags about how this controversy has brought so many new signups. Like, why? It didn't leave me with a feeling of confidence in it. Everyone knows that BetterHelp has a lot of clients and many of them are happy. We get that. What do you want? A fucking pat on the back? And I'm not saying these aren't achievements to be proud of, but they're not relevant to the discussion. 
even the more ludicrous claims. It just feels like you're appealing to a greater morality to deflect the allegations. If we want to discuss the cultural impact of better help, then we will. But the specific problems aren't alleviated by that. In the words of famous philosopher Brian Quang Lei, it's irrelevant. Another very interesting fact was how Alon viewed BetterHelp himself. In one paragraph, he takes the time to actually respond to one of the legitimate criticisms and does admit that he made a mistake of including what I'll call the get out of jail free clause and referred to it as standard legalese, which I think is one of the biggest problems with BetterHelp. They seem to lapse into these moments where they view themselves as a corporation like any other, and mental health isn't like any other. Mental health should not have a market value. It's not a commodity to be bought and sold, and therefore having, quote, standard legalese that absolves the responsibility isn't really on and does create legitimate concerns. However, he admitted it was wrong, so I won't give him too much stigma, but it's definitely something worth thinking about going forward. You are not just any old company who can simply throw down a copy and pasted terms and conditions. Also, we all make spelling mistakes, but once again, and maybe, maybe just spell check a bit. Just a thought. Now we could finish here and get on to the YouTubers, but we're not finished. Oh, how I wish we were. Because I said I'd give this an original spin, and this is where we come back to the marketing point. <laughs> Now, I've been doing psychology as a subject for a good few years alongside my politics, philosophy and international law. And part of what they teach is research methods, which is analysing and replicating the techniques used in psychological studies. So I became particularly intrigued when I noticed on their front page they boasted a 98% rate of individuals involved in their programmes making significant progress, despite the fact that only 70% experienced an alleged reduction in depression, which is a rather sizable margin, uh, considering I'd assume a reduction in symptoms is correlated with the idea of progress. But still, 70% is significant, and hey, they were conducted by the Berkeley Wellbeing Institute. Sounds like a very reputable place. Am I right or am I right? I mean, how could I be wrong? I'm the right opinion. So I decided to take my expertise and investigate this study a bit more closely. After all, these are some pretty noteworthy bragging rights. And there were two studies. Two, not just one. So let's have a look at them and break them down and see if we can find any little mistakes. Now what may stand out to some people straight out the gate is the gynocentrism, which is known as the predominance of women in the study. And although definitely having 78 and 80% females can skew results, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that the pool of subjects was just restricted, a point that we'll address very soon. No. What immediately struck me was how they restricted the participants in the results to individuals who have been clients of BetterHelp for three months and two weeks at least, which will immediately skew results as it's a significant amount of time and a high majority of people who aren't dissatisfied with the treatment they're receiving will have dropped out before then. Participant dropout is a considerable problem with any study. However, with an overwhelming majority of research, normally any study will explain how these sample of individuals were taken. For example, if they put out an ad in a newspaper, there is no clarification in this study, so I cannot possibly comment on the validity of the assemblance of such individuals. If these people were already intent on signing up to better help, then you're skewing the study group's decisions. Now, that may not be the case, but there is no comment on such so how can I compare? And although they do comment on the participant dropout, they do not clarify how many participants dropped out, which is extremely suspicious. If they ran this study from day one like they claimed, they should have clear statistics on the number of people who exited the study. As they took questionnaires at the start, this should have been easy, and they need to include this because, to provide an example, if 90% of participants dropped out citing ineffectiveness of the therapy, then the 70% of the 10% left who experienced decreased depression symptoms, it wouldn't mean jack shit. I highly doubt it's anything like 90% dropout for your information, but they have to include that statistic. Otherwise, I find the contents of this study completely invalid. And I quote, This approach may have led to a bias including people in the study who favoured BetterHelp e-counselling. Wow. Just maybe. I think these researchers might be onto something here, lads. On top of this, the study failed to use any control group to make the comparison of BetterHelp's therapy with regards to face-to-face, -face. and although not necessarily a requirement with regards to the variables being used, given how one of their claims is the preference over face-to-face -face therapy, it bemuses me why they wouldn't take advantage of their most scientific opportunity to prove it. But as noted on their page, they do note their clients have a specific predilection towards their content over face-to-face, -face. so how did they source such information? As said, it was backed up by research. Well, let's talk about the second study. 
This study is much worse than the first one because there is no pre-treatment questionnaire. You could only respond to this questionnaire if you had already taken treatment for three months, which is unbelievably terrible methodology. Like, I cannot begin to explain how awful that is. I've already explained how this is a flawed approach on the first study, but at least they took the evaluations before the treatment. Like, come on, guys. Anyhow, one of the other possible components of the other study was that they had 318 participants. Not the most, but a decent amount. This study had the grand total of 48 participants for one set of questions and 38 for the comparison of face-to-face -face therapy. So you know that 98% statistic that's on the front page? That was literally 47 people and the one person who said otherwise was the 2%. This is some excellent data collection, lads. Excellent data collection. And as said, they had the perfect opportunity to conduct comparative research between the effects of face-to-face -face therapy and online therapy. Why did they decide to undertake such unreliable methods to provide validity to their claims when there were better options? Equally, in his written defense, Matters boasts that they've helped hundreds of thousands of people and yet a study proving its success that is promoted on the front page could only gather 48 people. Only 48. I wish I was finished criticizing this study, but I'm not. Throughout the study, it is infested with this annoyingly complimentary tone towards BetterHelp. For these reasons, the present research enables us to begin clarifying the unique benefits of a high-quality and modality-integrated e-counseling platform. This is at the start of the study. If a study sets out to prove how good something is, chances are it's a tad biased. There are many more examples of such high praise that I'll chuck on the screen now. I don't need to read them out. On top of this, the study fails to distinguish between e-therapy and BetterHelp therapy, as if BetterHelp has trademarked e-therapy and it completely ignores the premise that there are already plenty of other online therapy sites and therefore just turns into an extended ad for better help and just equivocates better help to online therapy in general to summarize i'm not a fan of the study it also doesn't help that the individual central to the Berkeley Institute Wellbeing, Cheeky S. Davis, has a testimonial page. And on that testimonial page is a BetterHelp community and support manager, Noor Baker, who sings high praises for Davis, saying that she has been a vital part of BetterHelp's research efforts. So it appears that these people are quite closely associated. A highly personal team player, I'm sure. All this data is completely manipulated. Now, in response to this information, Mr. Matters here may say, well, it's just a corporate thing. And that's true to an extent. I highly doubt that those L'Oreal adverts that show that 80% of women have skin that feels smoother after application are studies done under scientific conditions. But that's what annoys me. BetterHelp seems to want to present themselves as better than your average company. But equally, with that comes a level of trust. That means they can't just behave like any other corporation. They shouldn't be going around manipulating data and they will be held to higher standards. Psychological studies are extremely important to the scientific community, particularly in working out which methods of therapy work best for the public. BetterHelp or Davis have taken advantage of this structure and made a study that looks appealing from the outside but does not warrant front page claims. And having something like 98% made significant progress is inherently misleading. And this comes back to what's annoyed a lot of people, whether it's the very suspicious reviews, the failure to want to take responsibility, or this little debacle that I've just unpacked. It's the contradiction. On one hand, they proudly proclaim the positive results they've received and represent themselves as this highly reputable site with scientific backing. On the other hand, their conduct is very corporate and manipulative, which would be normal in a way for a business if it weren't dealing with people's mental health. And this is the epitome of corporate tactics. But it's not what people want for such a website. You can't be the good guys while acting like that. You can't have your cake and eat it. But you know who can? YouTubers. Well... Let's get a slice. With all this research, it may come as a surprise that BetterHelp has been promoted for a while by YouTubers all over the platform. Many of them are people with strong moral grounding. DeFranco, Boogie, Jax Films, Shane Dawson, H3, some of whom we'll touch on later. Firstly, I want to talk about why on earth YouTubers would be so keen to jump on something so precarious. I mean, we're dealing with mental health here. As PewDiePie said, anything like that is a rickety bridge, particularly when you're dealing with sponsors. Some audiences won't want you even putting ads on a video about mental help. And although I'd say I'm arguably slightly more easygoing than that, I can still see why it is a cause for concern. 
we have come a long way as content creators to move towards this more open era of discussion. However, I think it's really important to emphasize that these individuals are only projecting their own personal experiences. And though these experiences may help you come to terms with your own personal conditions, the best course of action is to then seek confirmation through an expert. Now, I do not deny that BetterHelp is a relatively professional site. However, even they agree that they cannot provide formal diagnoses. But I'm sure there are a few therapists who haven't got that message given how discreetly it's been delivered. Point is, when you have a video talking about mental health and then say, and this is sponsored by BetterHelp, it does not serve as a fully endorsed supplement to the problems that you may be working on to discover. Even they won't endorse themselves. Once again, it could well be a get out of jail free clause, but I don't think that makes it any more acceptable in those instances. On the other hand, I don't want to completely trash the concept of online therapy, as it can provide important support to those who have fears of even going outside. Some people who may not have the privilege of affording face to face, that shit ain't cheap. And so when thinking about this, when the fact that BetterHelp emphasized these elements to many of the YouTubers who promoted it, many of them who've probably been in the same positions, I can understand why some of them seem very keen. I spoke to Boogie about this in a conversation, and one of the things that he said he did was try the site out for himself. And this is something that a lot of creators emphasized, and their experience with such individuals on the site was pretty great. So suddenly, what happened was BetterHelp was the shoe that fit Cinderella's foot for many of these YouTubers. Many of us are cooped up inside a lot, many of us do suffer from mental health issues. You have to be kind of insane to do YouTube, it's a draining occupation. Because although in some ways it is easier, the networking and the business makes it a ruthless job to go anywhere. You really have to be willing to put in the extra shift, because there's always someone out there willing to go that one step further than you. And that environment won't just shape people, but it'll also attract people of that certain persuasion. And so the market for this was huge. This is likely why many YouTubers did rush to promote it. After all, they had their positive experiences, they saw the general feedback, and it all looks pretty affirmative. And many of these creators have done brand deals before. On top of this, you know, promoting something like this, it makes you look good. There's no doubt about that, whether it was their intention or not. Promoting mental health stuff is good. You know, you might help people and you'll come out with a better image. Many of these creators have done brand deals before. Many of them are used to promoting content. And let's be honest, who reads the terms and conditions? Why should the content creators make an exception this time round? Well, because it's an exceptional situation and it comes back to mental health. I'm going to try and avoid repeating myself too much here, but YouTubers can't go around and treat these sites like any other gig. It was unbelievably naive to think that that was a good idea to do so. Now, I'm legitimately not against people being sponsored by such sites. However, it's even more important to be sensitive when you're actually going to be profiting off it. Once again, it's a sponsorship. I wouldn't expect anything else to an extent, but at the same time, a high majority of these people received money per sign up, and therefore it was important that there were things being explained clearly, because you influence how many people sign up. Now, I will hold BetterHelp to account to an extent, as I believe they did fail to notify many YouTubers of the little clauses they'd inserted, particularly one saying it's not an ample substitute. But responsibility should also fall on the shoulders of content creators for not being more ready to research it. Another problem that was definitely the cause of it spreading so quickly was the fact that people just saw other YouTubers promoting it and likely judged the brand on the basis of that. As said, BetterHelp went after a lot of moral staples in the community, and once they were promoting it, I'm sure many other other content creators saw it and it caused a subsequent domino effect of unfounded trust in it. Building on this trust point, BetterHelp was also partly partnered with Philip DeFranco's business Rogue Rocket. And for some YouTubers being reached by a trusted member of the community probably instilled a sense of faith, even though as mentioned in other videos, that was all it essentially did. Given the business model of taking a cut of the sign up, BetterHelp could have as many YouTubers promote it as possible without losing any money. It's natural for companies to want more sign ups, more money, and so on. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. Equally, the YouTubers being used to promote this were definitely using their trust over their viewers, which is likely why the backlash has been so strong, because you're putting forward a case for a website that deals with mental health and you're subsequently profiting off them. It has to be watertight, and it wasn't. I watched a lot of these promotions for these sites and generally I didn't think many of the creators were acting in bad faith. I think they just didn't know better. 
Going forward, I don't think they have to plow through the terms and conditions for all their future products. Though it's not a bad idea, but I definitely recommend being a bit more meticulous, at least for certain products, and making sure that you, what you're promoting is something that a person will be able to make a clear, conscious decision to go into, particularly if everything is not as clear as it seems. The problem is that sponsors typically place a shared responsibility on the creator and the user. The creator to deliver a truthful perception of the service and the user to make that conscious decision to involve themselves with the product. The problem with mental health promotion is that you're dealing with people who could be vulnerable and thus may have diminished responsibility, therefore shifting even more responsibility to deliver an honest presentation onto the creator. And unfortunately because they misused that responsibility, people felt more animosity towards them. Now this immediately means that regardless of how earnest the intentions of these creators were, they were going to be staring down a significant amount of criticism because of the shortfalls of the site and the marketing. At the end of the day, they were equally a part of the marketing as the botch study and the forged reviews. And although they were likely misled, they're still autonomous beings and they still have a level of responsibility. And as always on my channel, this makes the responses to such criticism just as important as the criticism itself, which is where we'll go now. One of the creators who was sponsored by BetterHelp was the YouTuber Domix. Now he's an animator. And as noted in previous videos, we already know that they have quite a tight relationship with their audience, and that manifests a lot of trust. Also, given the audience of such creators, it probably means that this could appeal to such a demographic. Following the BetterHelp incident, he put out this set of tweets. In my opinion, this was the best way to respond. He acknowledges the flaws, acknowledges the mistakes that he made on his part, and relinquishes the gains that he made of it due to his lack of awareness. And this is an important point. At the end of the day, whether BetterHelp is being misframed or not. Even if it was a great site, the lack of further research is something that would be a flaw regardless of the site's performance. If people were more familiar with the site, they could have either spoken to the site prior and perhaps had some changes, or they might not have proceeded with such a sponsorship. On the other hand, they may have been in a better position to defend it. At this point, it's reasonable to hold up your hands and say, I was ignorant to these things. I don't think that's a crime, but it is a mistake given the context of the sponsorship. You have to vet a bit more tightly, which is why this is probably the best way to respond because regardless of the context it's a mistake that many of them were guilty of another thing that a lot of creators said was that they did actually sign up and try it and many of them had positive experiences and then wrongly assumed that their experience spoke louder than any individual problems these are all mistakes that any associated creator can accept I can accept them. Most YouTubers took that route. Many bluntly stated that they were ending any relationship with BetterHelp. Another fairly safe response. You don't want your words to be twisted. However, there was another way to respond, which is where we're going now. The sort of responses that we've just spoken about is when a person facing down these allegations can accept they've made a mistake and be apologetic. The positives are that it often means that people are forgiving of us and it means that hopefully we can move on. However, it can also be a negative, as if we feel that what's been committed isn't that bad. By apologizing, we push the standards up for what we view as wrong. Equally, if we apologize for too much, we seem weak and too intent to please others. And then it creates the question of how we keep making these mistakes again and again and again. Apologies cannot be overused, or else they become disingenuous and the whole notion of an apology implies that we want to do better. So apologizing continuously diminishes the meaning of each apology and will make people more critical every time you try to do it. For that reason, this leads us to the other side of the spectrum. But there are some people who remain completely steadfast on what they've done and are never prepared to admit that they've made mistakes. Now, I have to admit, I think even as the most informed person, it would be hard to defend a position in this situation without taking a hit. But there are people who do this in these sorts of situations, mainly because they shoehorn themselves into such circumstances. I understand the logic. Sometimes by coming out against allegations in an aggressive manner, you can shut them down. But equally, if these allegations have more grounding than you anticipate them to be, you can come across as unnecessarily defensive and insecure, leading to increased suspicion on your involvement with such a predicament, which is where we lead to Philip DeFranco. Now, I made a sympathetic video in the past on DeFranco. At the time, it was my best performing video, and it was a great achievement. Brought me lots of new fans, many of whom I assume are mutual fans of DeFranco. Hey there, if you're one of them and you're still watching, I appreciate your service. I stand by what I said in that video. These points do not change, but his response was definitely taking a page out of Alan Mattis' book. 
joke, which isn't necessarily a good way to respond. Initially, this response was well received, but once commentators made responses and even Colossal published one to the baited channel, a lot of cracks began to show. Once again, as a response to many of the points that DeFranco set up, they weren't unreasonable responses. But the problem is that it was premised as a response to the whole better help situation. But Philly D was very carefully picking out points that he was responding to. And once again, if you want to defend yourself against some of the more ridiculous allegations, it's not a bad position, but there is less acknowledgement of wrongdoing than in Alon's hackneyed response. I think this is aggravated by the fact that Philip said this. And also to everyone in general, I apologize if I end up repeating things. I know I talked about this last Thursday, but I think just in one dedicated setting, it's important that I hit on all the notes since for some reason, depending on who is talking about this story, certain parts are excluded or glossed over or exaggerated or misconstrued. And this is probably true to an extent, but it's very clear that Philip's portrayal isn't comprehensive either. BetterHelp has been a sponsor of our videos. We've even partnered with them at a company level to help them with other sponsorships with other YouTubers. And so that clip has been misconstrued as, oh, that's the smoking gun. That is the evidence that Philip DeFranco, he is invested, he is part of it, he is the mastermind. Well, I wouldn't use the term smoking gun, uh, but it could be in the sense you didn't reveal you were partnered with BetterHelp before you sponsored with them. You've now clarified that your first sponsorship with them was made before you partnered with them, which is fine, but what about all the others you did after that? There's a lack of transparency here, which should be an obvious concern to anyone because you're promoting something that you've got an invested interest in. And it's one that goes beyond your standard sponsorship, I think. That doesn't have to mean you've literally invested in better help yourself, but not disclosing your partnership makes all your sponsorships, other than the first one now, a clear conflict of interest. Sit down and ask yourself if you benefit from better help success even without a DeFranco sponsorship, and the answer will be yes. Yes. And once this was observed by other creators, he quickly fell victim to the consequences. Responding to criticism is a balancing act, knowing when to apologize and knowing when to rebut. And DeFranco clearly has a faith in BetterHelp, maybe a product of his investment. But the problem is that people have already taken that point of view into account. And therefore, DeFranco's presentation that these critics have this delusion about BetterHelp that needs to be corrected before we can even have a discussion, a discussion that DeFranco doesn't even get to in the video, is in inherently condescending. It's clear that DeFranco wanted to keep BetterHelp in positive standing with the video and defend its position, and really, he may have been the person to do that. But I think it was a lose-lose predicament, that if he had addressed the worst arguments, people would call him out for not addressing the best ones. And if he addressed the best ones, he'd probably have a hard time because you can't counter them, particularly when BetterHelp had already pulled pages and information that had been criticized, meaning that they had already implicitly admitted they'd made such mistakes. So the only argument that you could make is that BetterHelp as a greater product hasn't been that tainted and that argument just wouldn't wash with viewers in the current state. So DeFranco arguably did the best he could with the quote defensive argument but it wasn't enough and in my opinion he should have accepted there were mistakes and just admitted it. I don't think there was any way out of it. One of the aspects DeFranco mentioned in his video was that he would be taking a trip to the headquarters of BetterHelp to ascertain their mode of operation. To me, it seemed like a fairly harmless venture, but one that wouldn't really change anything. Following this, he uploaded this post explaining his position on it. And honestly, I read the first paragraph and it seemed like he was making a lot of sense. But then he says this, with that all said, we'll be fully ending our relationship with BetterHelp. This is not based on anything that came from the meeting, but from a place of understanding that part of the community just does not feel it as appropriate to have a sponsorship with a company in the mental health space. And this annoyed me. It did. And I'm a fairly placid person, so it must mean something. I want to say something about it. It's not that people weren't ready for a sponsorship with mental health. There are many of us who accept that under the premise, this could be a good idea. This could be something that works and changes lives. And for a while, many people promoted BetterHelp without repercussions. Sure, there were some people who were protesting it, but they're not people who caused this. No, what caused this was the shifting tide in public sentiment about the credibility of the website, based on significant problems which they themselves clearly submitted to. Yes, people probably had bad experiences with therapists, and obviously, in light of scandals, these complaints came to the forefront of the discourse. But at the same time, this was equally a deeper problem with marketing and philosophy, shifting responsibility onto the community as if they're not happy with any mental health websites at all just seems like a kick in the teeth, barely a few lines after you admitted that they had problems, whether you considered them derisory or not. 
YouTubers have this real problem of understanding sometimes. Besides the stories that have come to light of recent, it's what an environment like that can breed. It's the potential. When people see companies shifting responsibility with such clauses, when people see companies manipulating their market, whether the service is good right now is besides the point. Because when you have a company that's willing to behave like that, people lose trust because of what might happen in the future and what they might let happen. In my opinion, you should be empathetic to that. People were right to criticize it because it gave them too much leverage for exploitation to occur within that site. And for you to then say that you'd heard the stories that people had told you and you presented them to them at the BetterHelp headquarters. And then going back to conclude that there was the community who just wasn't cool with mental health is audacious. As if we were the ones responsible. We don't have to change. We should be critical. We should drive home these principles of companies being honest. Whether it's in the advertising or in the fine print. Particularly when dealing with the issue of mental health. It's not a dollar shave club sponsorship where the results are fairly consistent. You'll get a nice clean shaven chinny chin chin. There is an immense amount of trust being levied here. It is the company that needs to change, not us. Whether it was the fake testimonials, the get out of jail free clauses, or the pseudo scientific study that was being used to try and elevate their results. They were the ones who weren't ready. Not us. I spoke to a lot of community members, a lot of content creators, and the sentiment was that they wanted to promote and support this, but they found themselves ultimately in a corner where the company they wanted to support hadn't presented themselves honestly. And as marketers and beneficiaries, they became implicated in this. When people sign up to BetterHelp, it was presented like it was a substitute. So it became an assumption to the viewer. The only thing that was constantly mentioned in the BetterHelp adverts were that it wasn't an emergency hotline. Other than that, no details were given. It is also assumed that the people who hire the therapist, better help themselves, would take some level of responsibility. It is instinctively assumed that the reviews were honest, the research is honest, with content creators using that trust. Promoting this, they became the source of the stigma because they have promoted these assumptions that although I believe they assumed too, they should have known better because the trust that their audience has in them reinforces those assumptions. One of the things about mental health is its uniqueness. No two people have the same mentality. It's all one human huge mess and we on YouTube we're all messes nothing is new about that but we need to be clear in what's being offered and who it's being offered to signing up to better help and having a good experience isn't evidence that every experience is going to be good YouTubers share a lot of mental health experiences and I think it's important and often the overarching narratives of their stories can touch on a general struggle that is felt by many but equally they shouldn't equate this to everyone's struggle and in this instance they need to look at the roots of what they were supporting rather than just the singular experience that they had and working outwards they needed to go bottom up rather than top down to understand mental health is different to just experiencing the complications facing it and it's a tricky tightrope to tread i think that going forward everyone has a responsibility to know what they're promoting will be right for their audience when it comes to sensitive topics because i do believe in some perks of online therapy it won't be for everyone but for those people it may be an important first step for people who have problems leaving the house and such these are real changes that can be made i don't want this video to be just a bashing of the premise of online therapy no I'm just bashing this execution. It's a message to those who should do better. When you can do better, why wouldn't you? I want to close this video by providing you with a little allegory from my current philosophy professor, who was actually a really interesting bloke. Big props to him for being one of the first tutors to make philosophy interesting. And he said that when dealing with much of the moral philosophy that we were covering, the moral arguments are like a speed limit we set. We can't expect that everyone will drive within that speed limit. Many people will behave outside of what is considered acceptable from time to time. By setting the speed limit, we move that responsibility onto the driver. And they become accountable for their actions. If we didn't set that speed limit, then people are free to drive as fast as we want, possibly with dangerous consequences, and people will look to us, the hypothetical government, for not putting a speed limit on there when we knew better. With their behavior, BetterHelp almost wanted to set a speed limit, but didn't enforce it for themselves at least, and then try to waive a responsibility in case an accident happens. On top of this, they failed to market themselves honestly, and at the center of this were many content creators. YouTubers were caught up because of a huge proportion of the dishonesty that came from the marketing. As said, I doubt that many of them had bad intentions, but they clearly dived into something much deeper than they had anticipated. I think there were some questionable responses to criticism from the company and from some content creators that I hope I've addressed comprehensively. For me, going forward, I'm ready to support websites that help people cope with the struggles of life. However, we should be very thorough when making sure that what we see is what we get. 
and that the right structure is in place to hold the right people accountable because mental health is volatile and things will go wrong and when they do we want responsibility that's what matters better help weren't ready for that unfortunately hopefully next time whatever comes forward will be so to finish where I started, H3's response to PewDiePie was very strange, and I don't understand why he made the comments as if PewDiePie had even slightly directed the video at him, because PewDiePie left a specific disclaimer that this wasn't the case, and I don't think anyone received the impression that Felix was attacking them, let alone them specifically. The way that he presented my involvement in it, I thought was a little misleading and a little out of context and it made it look like I was way more involved with this company than I was, or even that it made it look like I used my being depressed yeah. to somehow sell better help. Ethan took it far too personally and he shouldn't be so fragile, but a greater narrative may have to be preserved for another time. I think my time is up with this video. It's gone on long enough. Anyhow, I want to finish up by thanking my editors. Once again, I'm going to leave their links in the pinned comment below. Definitely go and check them out if you have the chance. Some of them are really great content creators and are definitely moving on to greater things in the future. I'm sure of it. Also, I'd love to hear what you think about this topic below. Um, I'll be reading some of the comments. If you want to reach me personally with a comment, then you can hit me up on Twitter at The Right Opinion. You can hit me up on Discord. I've got my link server in the pinned comment. And on Facebook, I use that too from time to time. So we're on all platforms, bar Instagram. No Instagram yet. I don't know, maybe when I become vain enough, I'll, uh, I'll download it. I had good fun making this one, even though it's been quite exhausting. This was uh, not the easiest video to make, but uh, we got there in the end. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Don't really have anything else to say. I hope you guys are doing well. Until then, however, I'm The Right Opinion, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>